Hello, and welcome to Monster Island Radio, a show where we discuss one of our favourite movie franchises, Godzilla. Each episode, we pick a movie from the series and talk about the highlights, lowlights, and everything in between, and why Godzilla is one of our favourite monsters. Hello and welcome to another episode of Monster Island Radio. Uh, I'm Ben and I'm joined by... Brian! Hello! <laughs> right, so we're going to resume our run through of the Millennium Era films um, with Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Everybody. So we had a little break on the last episode, we did Shin Godzilla. Just to, just to you know, mix it up a little. Now we're going to carry on because we've got this film to talk about and then two films after that and then that's the Millennium Era done. Right. So... Uh, so, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla came out in 2002. This one's a bit of an outlier in the Millennium series, as it's the only one in this era to um, make reference to other kaiju movies yeah. besides the 54 Godzilla. So, it's got references to um, War of the Gargantuas and Mothra. And it's the only one in the Millennium era to have its own sequel. Oh, really? Yes, with Godzilla Tokyo SOS. Oh, okay. I th- yeah, I knew there was a two-parter at some point. Yeah. But I didn't realise it was this one, so... Yeah. Okay. So, as always, give a little rundown for the plot for those who need reminding. And for those who haven't seen it, here be spoilers. I realised every single time we do these, I never <laughs> I never say that there are going to be spoilers in this. I don't, so. I don't think people need telling on this show that we're no? spoiling it. No, it's fine. Okay, cool. We'll get with it then. Right, okay. So, we open with a battle against a new iteration of the Godzilla species attacking Japan. The military are trying to fight off Godzilla with weapons that that were designed and accrued over the years from fighting other kaiju, such as Mothra and Gaira. During the battle, Lieutenant Akane Yashiro accidentally causes one of the vehicles to fall down the side of a cliff and get trampled by Godzilla. Whoopsie. (laughs) Oopsie-daisy. As a result, she is demoted and transferred to being a desk jockey for the foreseeable. Um... After the battle, it became evident that a new type of weapon would need to be produced in order to fight off Godzilla, as the current arsenal was ineffective. As the designs for the oxygen destroyer from 1954 went to the grave along with Dr. Serizawa, they need to try something else. So they employ the help of a group of scientists who include Tokimitsu Yohara, a scientist who specialises in creating mechanised organisms of extinct animals. See where we're going with this? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, he's brought along to a site where the JXSDF who are the Japanese Xenomorph Self-Defense Force great name uh, yep have uh, recovered the bones of the 54 Godzilla and want to create a mechanized specimen that can fight off the new Godzilla after four years of development Mechagodzilla dubbed Kiryu is unveiled showing its capabilities the machine can be controlled remotely by pilots and recharged remotely by microwave technology and boasts a freeze ray or an absolute zero cannon, which will leave the target frozen and brittle. Um, Akane was brought back into the fold as a pilot for Mechagodzilla and is then deployed to battle against the new Godzilla. And things seem to be going well until uh, Kiryu hears Godzilla's roar and triggers a memory response. And he refuses to fight and instead turns on the military and the city. So that DNA computer inside this Mechagodzilla ain't looking so good now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, After Kiyu's power drains, it's brought back to base for reconfiguration before being deployed again into battle. Uh, Kiyu sustains a great deal of damage and needs a manual override in order to continue battle. So Akane risks her life by piloting Kiyu manually from inside to finish the battle. The fight continues, but ends in a draw, and Godzilla retreats back to the sea, having sustained heavy damage, and the city is safe once more. Mm. So, all right. Initially, I'm, I immediately got very strong Godzilla versus Mega Gearus vibes from this, which had me worried, frankly. Because uh, yeah. as, as we've discussed <laughs> in a previous episode, we're not the biggest fans of that movie. And I feel that kind of goes against the grain of the fan base a little, because I think people quite enjoy that film, whereas we... We're not really in that camp. Uh, and we, 
Yeah. Yeah. And we have the flashbacks at the start uh, with the like the female military protagonist, like the same as um, Godzilla vs. Megaurus, the big musical score. It all harkens back to that. Um, I mean, I feel it was like a, it was a marked improvement compared to Godzilla vs. Megaurus. And, you know, I didn't realize it was the same director until after the fact. Uh, well, I didn't look it up, but while I was watching, I was just like, this is the same team. I didn't, yeah. I didn't clarify it because I honestly I forgot <laughs> to look it up. But yeah, I, when I was watching, I was like, "This is this is the same group of people." I, I'm sure of it. Yes, yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you want me to lay out my just like a, a brief yeah, opinion I, of it? I mean, yeah. I was going to say, what, what were your feelings about it? And I was going to ask, did you get the same feeling that I did? Well, like, yeah. Is it the same movie, basically? <laughs> to put it succinctly, I would say that with Mega Gearus, this movie is um, it has better action. But weaker characters. Do you think weaker characters than yeah. Godzilla vs. Megaguirus? I really do, You're and kidding. I was actually kind of surprised. I thought the opposite. Uh, well, what, what did you think the action was not as good? No, no as in uh, the just action for the was characters. Consider- the characters, yeah. I see. Yeah, I really felt the characters were just like hollow. But mm. that was my that's my summary of my feelings watching it. It's like I probably enjoyed it more than Megaguirus, just because like mm. the action was there, although it was a long time coming, and I kind of. Um, cynically enjoyed the the drama scenes because I felt they were like I oh, I felt bad for having criticised Mega Gears so much actually watching <laughs> them I was like these are worse <laughs> and much worse but um, overall mm. I think I enjoyed the movie more because like I say the action was was good when it happened but yeah I mean wow that that story it's a real like you sort of with the with the, cut, the um with the flashbacks. Yes. It's a real, they say in movie making, you should um, show, not tell. But it isn't like that at all. They just verbally explain a lot of things, just like directly to you. Do you mean the flashbacks to the other movies or like or to 54? That's an example of it. But there's other parts in the movie where they just like, they just talk through things rather than actually like making a movie for like lack of a better um, way of putting it. But like there's a scene like when they're, when they're fighting between... Mecha Godzilla and Godzilla and Kiryu, like the machine, is losing power. And they're like, oh, we need to take the power from Tokyo City to like recharge it. And it just had, they needed to have a little discussion about it. Like, oh, yeah, we've got to call up the power company then. And this guy's like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Um, they'll, they'll listen to me if I call them. And it's just so we, like, we get all the admin as well. Yeah, and it's, it's not satirical in the same way it was in um, Shin Godzilla. It just feels like it's just mm-hmm. there because that's, they really thought that needed to be explained. And I'm like, if your country was under threat from a, a massive kaiju, you wouldn't think twice about taking the power. So I just like just just do it, and I just feel like they could have sped it up a lot. And but if you did speed up the story, it'd be very there short. Wouldn't be much left. No. So uh, well, let's <laughs> let's talk about the story a little okay, bit. Because okay. um, I mean, if, uh, it's not particularly complex, is it? Won't it take really? Long, so. No. I mean, um, so. We're in this world where they're used to kaiju attacks, essentially, and alien threats. Okay. So it's not a surprise anymore. Each time they have to figure out a new way to do something. So this new Godzilla figure, you know, get get Godzilla to fight it. It's like pretty straightforward. And that's kind of it, really. Really, that is kind of it when yeah. it comes to like the, the core of the film. Mm. And it's kind of interesting that Godzilla takes a bit of a backseat in this one. And he's really only present for the battles. Lacked a personality as such. I know that we. This is something we say, but you, it must be very, very difficult to give Godzilla himself uh, an individualized personality over and over and over. Mm. But we kind of know we can we can see some of the same stuff again, and it's like you know, just didn't really feel like he was a character. Really. No, I, I think because um, they're trying to paint him in a um, in a more malevolent malevolent light again. Yeah, you it's know, because like, like at the start you've got. Uh, after the attack, you see the that fallout shelter, you know, where there's the victims there watching the news and stuff like that. And, like, immediately you just see Godzilla as kind of a bad guy. Mm. And it's just, again, just like an animal. And it's like, there's there's no connection to Godzilla there whatsoever. Um, o- only to the victims. It's like they wanted him to feel like the animalistic Shin Godzilla type thing. Mm. Um, but they didn't really put any effort into it. I mean, there's yeah. lots of movies from Millennium Era that... That, that kind of come at it from different angles and we've seen that animalistic approach before from this like period of Godzilla. It's kind of interesting so, yeah. that you're saying that 
you know, we've seen all this sort of stuff before because I feel like this film is a collection of everything that's been done before and I wouldn't say it's necessarily been done better. No, that's like, part of the problem really, isn't it? Yeah, because, I mean, you the uh, if we're going to... Well, we can talk about the characters, I guess. I mean, you've got um, the the female lead who's in the military, pretty much lifted straight from um, Godzilla vs. Megaguirus. You got Tokamitsu Yohara and Sarah, his daughter, and they're almost exactly the same as the um, Shinoda and his daughter from Godzilla 2000. Yeah, yeah. And it's so they've kind of pasted those together. You've got the animalistic Godzilla, which is you know, I mean that's been done before. Obviously. Yeah, it's like just about present sort of thing. Yeah, and even, even Mecha Godzilla is not a new thing. No, but so. I do I do like the change where it's um. It's, you know, from the bones of the 54 Godzilla. I thought that was really cool. I feel like that was that's where it innovated most. It's funny that we talked about um, this on Shin Godzilla as well, but and I don't want to go on about it too much because I know mm. um, not everybody who watched Godzilla would have seen it, but with um, when we talked about Shin, we mentioned um, Evangelion quite a bit, the anime series, which is all kind of kaiju-based yes. fights. Yeah. And in this movie, they build this kind of, skeleton well they build a robot over a skeleton and i don't want to get into like spoiler territory for evangelion but like it's not too big of a stretch to say like there's a lot of kind of building robots with it with organic material sort of thing there's a similarity there right and it really felt like when they were in the scenes where it's like oh we spent four years building this this mecha and they were sort of standing in front of it on that little bridge where you can see like mecha godzilla's face is like right there you know there was that scene where the three of them were looking at it, and then the Sarah child, the little girl who has the voice of an adult woman <laughs> um, in the yes. American version, she was like ran away crying, like that scene. It's just like straight out of Evangelion. And like, it doesn't really have a, I mean, I don't think that anime has a massive impact in, in the West outside of just being a big like anime favorite. But in the mm. global sense, it's one of the most financially successful like media franchises it's really like high up in the rankings which i find quite surprising but i don't think you can take its popularity for granted in japan and it seems to me that this movie was more so than shin because obviously shin is directed by the guy who created evangelion this movie Mm. was like oh we're just going to take some of that because it was popular like about seven years before this movie came out that's when right. evangelion like hit big so yeah there's there's like set design and like the the whole like let's build a robot over a skeleton thing is like just exactly like it do you think it's um like homage to evangelion then because i with that kind of stuff i, I feel so out of the loop because i've never watched evangelion so no. i feel a bit like so no you don't think i'm missing anything there um what i would say is um, remember when uh, the Jason Bourne movies came out and were really popular and then yeah. they were like oh let's do a James Bond movie that's a bit like that and they made Casino Royale with Daniel Craig and it was a bit more like Jason Bourne right I see that's what I would like kind of similar similarize it to where it's like they're not kind of they're just sort of like oh people like this sort of stuff in kaiju media now so they're sort of half deliberately kind of just trying to make it similar that's what it felt like to me it wasn't they were like oh we're going to make evangelion we've got Dilla in it um because i'm pretty sure there's some official crossover somewhere i'm not like there an is, expert yeah. yeah so there's probably yeah. something like in that but this movie just felt like they were just trying to get with the times maybe and inadvertently copied it more directly than maybe they intended to it's right. really just that one scene where they're on the little bridge in front of his is the robot's big face where it's like this is like the the show but, right but overall the first like well the first two thirds of this movie feel like an episode of evangelion stretched out into an hour and evangelion is only like 22 minutes at a time anyway so yeah it was a real like oh my god but like yeah mm. the, the romance stuff and the oh so and so died because of my pratfall and the little kid who's got like a dead mum and all of this stuff is very much like evangelion content like you i say, say i was gonna say you say romance i mean oh I feel, yeah well. i feel bad for akane because like she well I mean, for starters she's got to put up with all of her peers constantly shouting at her and demeaning her and stuff very high and then school you, stuff yeah and then you got you know tokamitsu being the thirsty dad who's constantly hounding her despite being one to want to be left alone he's like twice her age i know right <laughs> it was seemingly just, anyway yeah, that guy was so annoying i was like oh my god just leave her alone yeah, and I don't really feel like it was a... I mean, I, I put this in my it notes. It wasn't cute. It wasn't cute. 
I feel like this was probably the worst dub I've seen in a long time of a Godzilla movie. It was not good. But I don't feel like it, the, it wasn't the dub's fault that the movie was so bad. You could see just in the performances <laughs> and the script, it was like, this is just like, <laughs> Okay, so bad. you think the movie was bad then? I think the movie... If we're getting to it. Well, like I said, the action was actually quite good. Mm. Um, it was fleeting, but what there was there was was really good. But in terms of the, the story and the drama and the human characters... Yeah, I would go on record saying it was worse than um, Nogogiras and probably the worst I've personally seen from Godzilla. Oh, my goodness. Because it just like felt so lip servicey, where it's like, oh, we're going to have this guy like romantically interact with this woman, but there was nothing there at all to the point where they didn't even attempt to have him flirt. They were like, oh, he's really bad at flirting to the point where he just asks her, basically asks her, does he want to, does she want to be the new mother to his child? That's, like, that's the, the first, first thing, thing he said, says. yeah. But there was no, like, fun or subtlety or, like, story to it. It just happened. The only character who kind so, of I wanted to see a bit more of, I suppose, was Sarah. The only interesting the only, one. Yeah, I liked her, partly because her voice was so comically miscast. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I mean, well, in the, in the uh, Japanese one as well, she's still a good character. Fair enough, yeah. So, yeah. basically the same. That was um, one of the best scenes where she was with her, like, school kids and they just all sounded like knockoff Rugrats voices <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she, I thought she was a nice character. I like the relationship between her and Akane as well. Um, it was interesting to have a child dealing with life and death after the death of her mother and the um, stillborn sibling and ch- channeling those emotions into what's, well, not inanimate, but, you know, the sleeping grass plant that reminds her of her mother. It's like, it's an interesting thing to see, not just having, oh, it's a kid. You know, that, that kid's dealing with something. Yeah, she was better than most, like, kid characters we've seen. I mean, she was she was easier to watch than the girl in... Godzilla 2000? Yeah, in Godzilla 2000, there's the little girl who acts a bit like a Bart Simpson-type character. Yeah, I liked she was her better. as well. I liked she her, great. but she was better than that. And she was also more enjoyable to watch than the little, the little boy in Mega Giras who's, like, trying to hide the egg, who was just a total <laughs> missed opportunity, and we talked about all that on that episode. So, yeah, she was easily the best character, and she did sort of stand a bit out from the crowd, not just in this movie, but like the whole Millennium series, I felt, and there was probably more they could have done with that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it just seemed to pay lip service to a lot of different ideas where nothing really sort of felt like it actually was fleshed out. It was just like, oh, we're just going to do some of this because we've kind of seen it in other movies and we're going to replicate it. And it was almost just like watching a movie like written by an AI or something. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because they've lifted out um, decent characters from other movies, put them in there, to just maintain that human interest, I think. Mm. So it wasn't really, they've not actually created anything as such there. And it's just, yeah, that the, these things work in these kinds of movies. Let's just put that in. So, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm kind of in two minds about this film because I know it's not fair to compare it to Mega Gears because it's, it really should be a separate film. But compared to that, it was, it was, in my opinion, much better, mainly because the characters were watchable. Right. And the action was much better. Well... You know, and like, if I just look at that, I'm like, well, that's a better film then, right? The action was way, way better. Way yeah. better. It was some mm. of the better action from this entire era. But um, in, if I was going to go and say this is a bad movie, which I, I kind of do think it is a bad movie, Mega Gearus was bad in a way where it was still kind of quirky and entertaining. Whereas these characters are so middle of the road and so vanilla that there's nothing entertaining about it like watching mega gears and getting annoyed at it was enjoyable to an extent because there was something there to get your teeth into and say like i don't like it because of this reason mm. whereas of this movie the characters were like just there and they were just completely inoffensive but not interesting at all and i was just like there's less it's, here to like in, to watch it's that sin of yeah there's it's not even inter- inter- yeah not even interesting enough to dislike yes it's yeah because I, I kind of like did like the main lead character and I thought like her little arc was interesting. But yeah, we, we saw it a couple of movies ago and mm. yeah, so it was just a bit kind of like we've walked this road, but it was more interesting the last time I walked it. And you could say like, oh, maybe if I watched this one before I watched Mega Gearus, I'd be the other way around. But I do feel like Mega Gearus had a lot of avenues of creativity that just weren't mined. And it's a real shame they just left a lot of stuff on the table. Yes. But um, this movie didn't have stuff on the table to begin with so yeah whoa <laughs> let's talk about um the godzilla design and kiryu as well okay so um 
I feel like the uh, the Kia you design was very, very anime Power Rangers, you know, Super Sentai sort of design. I mean, which works really well for giant fighting robots. Um, and I liked that the uh, like the DNA computer from the skeleton and stuff like that. I I really liked that whole idea. I thought that was quite cool, and, I, and the design was, I think, fit really well. Especially what, of those... the of Godzilla or of Mecha? A Mecha Godzilla. Okay. Um, I just thought it looked really good. I think it's probably the best looking Mecha Godzilla in my opinion. Uh, the Godzilla design I thought was quite good as well. Yeah. I mean, so they kind of went a bit more, a bit more realistic, I suppose. I think that's probably the best term. Um, by kind of downplaying his colours, he wasn't as didn't have like the purple, the purpley dorsal plates. They were more kind of um, like grey coloured and. He had like darker skin and stuff like that and they actually gave him more animatronics in the eyes to make him more expressive were there some shots that were just like cg not that i saw okay maybe i was just like imagining it i really i felt like there was a couple of shots where it was just cg like just the face but maybe not uh i don't think so i think the uh some of the flashbacks were because i know they had to build part of the 1954 suit oh again. maybe that was it yeah, so that and that part was quite CG, mm. but that still leaves the suit anyway. But uh, if we're talking about the visual effects as well, because it's that millennium era, there's still that sort of transitional period between traditional effects and CGI, where CGI still was kind of finding its way mm. in that era of movie making. Um, I still, I think this is probably the best looking CGI that they've done up to this up to that point in uh, Godzilla movies. Now, it still looks a bit wonky in places, but I mean, I mostly acclim- acclimatize to that kind of stuff anyway because I'm, you know, aware of that era of filmmaking, so I don't find it too distracting. Yeah, I mean, it's like when you watch any any old movie, there's usually some effect which doesn't look great, but when you're in them, when you're in the moment, when you're watching the film, it's just like you get kind of get used to, it, I guess. Mm. Um. So like CG was, yeah, it was, yeah, it's absolutely fine, I think. Um, and the practical effects, I think, were probably the best ones because you got um like those rocket pyrotechnics you know when got, uh, mecha godzilla's firing missiles and stuff um i don't even know how they did that to be honest with you like where they're doing like homing missiles that kind of curve round and then hit godzilla i thought it looked fantastic um and like when they're fighting and stuff like that you see sparks happening yeah i really liked when they were fighting towards the end the fight had like a real kind of sumo vibe at one point mm. that i really liked whether the two were like kind of grappling each other and trying to force the other one like back or over and i felt like that was quite a deliberate sort of sumo wrestler like moment that they did uh, yeah i really like that was that the part where the music had stopped and you could just hear the sounds of them fighting it might be because that was that was my favorite kind of fighting moment because the sound design is really good there. Like, you hear the mechanical sounds and things like that. And it also stopped that relentless fanfare music <laughs> for, like, 30 seconds, which I was, like, just gagging for. It's very patriotic sounding. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, I don't want to... I'm not going to rag on the soundtrack itself in isolation because um, it's, uh, it's the same person, uh, Michiru Oshima, who did the score for Godzilla vs. Megaguirus. Right. So it's basically like getting the band back together. Let's do this again. Yeah. Um, so they they obviously love the sound that she could she could make for this film, but I just don't think it goes like these like big fanfares. It's like, it's just it's just too overbearing and it's relentless. So anytime anything was happening, there was just all this music, and I I found it so distracting. It was starting to irritate me. Mm. So when that fight happened, when the music stopped, I was like, oh, here we go. Now it's getting a bit more serious. But then the music would kick back in again. And I'm not going to lay the fault at Oshima's feet on this because, you know, she's doing what she does very well. Like, it's well composed, you know, it's... It's just a pairing with the movie and that is what you don't like. Yes, and it's it's frustrating for me to keep hearing that. And I think that's initially what gave me the... uh, The vibe. The Mega Gearus vibes, yeah. When I heard that music, I was like, oh, this sounds really familiar. To me, it Um, was when there was a total lack of characterization <laughs> but, well yeah. that too <laughs> i didn't bother to research it so I, I i was just like yeah it was just an opinion until you said earlier that it was the same people i'm really not surprised at all mm. my favorite part of the fight was when their the stab took place um 
you the know, with the sword. Yeah, when Mecha Godzilla just like whips that, the sword out and just stabs Godzilla. That's the exact same point I'm talking about with when yeah. the music stopped. Yeah, I think it must be. Yeah, yeah. Um, really, really good. It's a bit of a trope. It's not some. It's not such a unique thing. I mean, there's a scene in the first Avengers movie where two people are fighting and one of them kind of like tricks the other by like looking like they're kind of w- walks out of the fight, but then he stabs him. <laughs> So I think it's it's a thing, and I'm sure there are loads of other movies where two people are fighting, oh, yeah. and then you see a stab in the abdomen sort of thing. Yeah. But I just wasn't expecting it in a Godzilla movie, but that's what you mm. do get with Mecha Godzilla. He's a kind of character because he's a robot. Yeah. He can do that. So um, that was the best part of the movie. That was where I was like, oh yeah, this is actually really good. If only there was more of a a, a more drama behind it, I probably would have felt more emotionally invested because I felt it was really well done. Yeah. So basically, any time there was a fight, it was good. Basically, that's the best way to sum up this this film, really, is, isn't it? Yeah, it's the lowest common denominator way of summing up a Godzilla movie, but with this yeah. one, it really was true. It really was. Um, they were like, I don't know, some of the moments were kind of borderline funny. I think, like when you had um, that kind of antagonistic guy who kept on, he was always on Akane's case. Yeah, um, when he like flew the plane into Godzilla's mouth, and then um, uh, <laughs> Mecha Godzilla grabbed the plane, threw it off, and then he went out oh, of his ejector seat it was like all those kind of moments were absolutely fantastic yeah it was great just, yeah so all those if you could kind of maybe the best way to watch this movie would be just to boil down all the fight scenes as a 10 minute compilation that was that was going to be exactly my recommendation is that if you are trying to show so many godzilla movies and this this one comes up it's like just watch the fight scenes mm because they're really good and like it's just a drag i mean yeah i mean you could put it on for background noise but it wasn't even like good enough for that i don't think it's just like yeah just just watch the it, highlights it feels like something you could put on on a sunday afternoon just you know just to have on yeah but you'd only put you don't you don't even like perk up when the fight scene started so i guess that's mm. that's fine but one thing i didn't really understand about the story so maybe you can fill me in is why they needed the skeleton or the DNA of the original Godzilla to make this thing and what advantage that gave them. Because obviously there's a point in the movie, which is, it's kind of, the problem's solved quite quickly, but when Mechagodzilla hears the new Godzilla's roar, he kind of like remembers that he's, a, you know, a creature and then doesn't want to be a robot anymore or something. Mm-hmm. That's all swept under the rug very quickly. But that problem of like having the DNA in there in the first place, well, what's, why? why so i f- <laughs> when i tried to find that out <laughs> what i could find out was that having a dna computer because it's um it was base four rather than binary like do it could process things much quicker which okay. is like which is the kind of the first explanation and that's in the film it kind of makes sense it's basically super fast computer great um why does it have to be godzilla um i think because only Godzilla could defeat Godzilla. Mm. And then having a DNA computer means that any unconscious movement could be is is handled by the computer and not by the person operating it. So let's say Akane you know, is remotely controlling Mecha Godzilla. She doesn't have to, you know, control each footstep or, you know, a lot of this kind of stuff is it's almost automated by the DNA. Oh, right. So, so it's like, like I, I need Godzilla to, you know, like jump up. I need him to jump. So that DNA computer then takes care of that part by the input of a simple action from the user. That, that's my... That's your thinking. That's my thinking. So it's sort of to do with system one, system two thinking. What's that? That's I don't know what that where means. system one does things in- instinctively in your brain and system two has to think about stuff and then react yes. after. Yes, so exactly. the DNA is system one and Akane is, is system two. It might be. Yeah. yeah, okay. But they could exactly. have just had a crocodile DNA. They could have had any, any yeah, <laughs> it didn't have to be Godzilla. Well, yeah. It was just so it could be like Evangelion, I think. It's probably That's it. probably it, isn't it? I thought the movie was on to something quite interesting when they did do the whole like, oh, Mecca's heard this, the roar and he's gone mm. rogue, and I was like, "Oh wow!" Like this is the oh, that was at the point in the movie where I was like, "The, the, the story has started." Yeah, we're forty <sighs> minutes in, but the story yep. is here now. Yeah. Um, but then they just but kind of then... got rid of that problem very quickly. Yeah, they were like, "Oh, it's a bug. Fixed it." In a better constructed film, that kind of would have been a good kind of like stalling point. Like, oh, the heroes have, have found a secondary problem. Act two stuff, you know. Yeah. 
but it just didn't leave an impression. It was a shame. Because they, they resolved it basically straight away. Yes. And it was just like a little glitch and not a an actual problem. So... I also didn't understand. Here's another question for you. I've, I've got a few things as well that I don't quite get, <laughs> but you, may, maybe you'll cover it. Go on. What? They've got this um, weapon, Absolute Zero. <laughs> yes. So they fire a beam of ice stuff um, mm -hmm. and it freezes things and then you shatter the ice and then he's done with, he's dead. Whatever it is, organic matter building, you can just freeze it and shatter it. So they want to fire Absolute Zero at Godzilla and do away with him. Yes. Doesn't work in the end, is the is the thing but aside mm -hmm. from that is why not just fire it straight away in this fight scene that we talked about with the, the, oh. the stab and the sumo and all this that let's we use all these liked. missiles first what they're right he's literally holding on to him with his hands like just fire absolute zero now also do you need a mechagodzilla to fire that cannon? no but that's yeah that's so thing. <laughs> yeah so I did, I, Absolute Zero just seemed to be there so it could just like be a thing. Because in the end, it didn't actually make a difference. No. It didn't work. <laughs> so it's like, well, okay. I was, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess you don't have an answer for me. No, I don't. Because, okay. it's, yeah, it was, just seemed a just bit... Just a silly thing. Just a silly thing, exactly. Um, did you have any other questions? <laughs> no, I, no, you can ask a question. <laughs> okay. What? As though I have an answer. <laughs> so... Why didn't Tokamitsu want to help out to begin with? Tokamitsu is the guy. Who, he's the dad, he's, the scientist. Oh, the dad. Well, because he was, I guess, and this is perhaps a little bit of depth, maybe. Ooh, here um, we go. He was, he was very concerned about how his daughter was coping with the bereavement of the dead mother, the dead wife, all that situation. I think he wanted to pri prioritise her grief and her upbringing well, and be close with her. And he felt, oh, this important work needs all my attention i can't be away from my daughter and that was why he was reluctant to to do it but then they mm. just said to him i'll oh, bring your daughter along and she can basically just like sit around and and not age i might add for yes, four years for four years um and that pro problem solved so again it was just an issue in the movie because because movies have problems ben <laughs> and then the problems get solved and yes. um you know in a real movie those things sometimes last a few minutes but in this one it's a few seconds is fine because you can't you can't argue that a lot of things do happen in the movie to be fair a lot of things just, do happen yes it's just that they're not worth anything like oh this guy wants to flirt with this younger lady it happens without leaving the yeah. impression daughter has dead mother arguably one of the more interesting parts of the movie but does it make a difference to anything no it doesn't absolutely zero it's it's there and then it's gone and it makes no difference it's just like so, I mean, this, yeah, this film was just a bit... Filler. Yeah, it was filler. And it it, it obviously appeals to people that aren't us. <laughs> well, like, because... That's a given, they, but why they, does it appeal? They they greenlit... So they did Megaguirus, and they were like, cool, that, that was great. Do another one. And then they greenlit a third film by these people. Oh, no. Which is yeah. going to be the next movie. My word. So it's just like... What what is it that we're not seeing? If anyone who's listening can tell us, just please, because there's something is not penetrating our brains here. There is something that well, it's just taste, I guess, and isn't it really? Like if you like methodical, um, easy come, easy go movie problems, and you know a lack of conflict, this is for you. So I mean, overall, let, let's give it uh, let's give it some credit. It doesn't outstay its welcome. No, it's a nice length. So that's, I think it's one of the shortest Godzilla films. I could be wrong there. I think it's one of the shortest. I'll tell you what, actually, I don't know about the version you watched, but the one, the one I watched, yeah, uh, there's like eight minutes of credits. Like, Oh, and an end credit scene. Is there an end credit scene? Yeah. Oh, I didn't watch that. That's not worth it. Oh, hold on. I could bring it up now and watch it. Yeah, go on. Go yeah, on then, hold on. I need to, need to put my glasses on. Hold on. I didn't know there was a post credit scene. So when the credits started, and I was like, these credits are eight minutes long. I just like turned it off because I was like, well, film's done. I was on my phone as the credits were rolling. <laughs> so like, I didn't even, I didn't turn it off. And then the credit scene happened. I was like, oh, right, there's more. Okay. okay I'll just get to it now. Oh, we, we've got live impressions coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, all you listeners. If you ever want to hear, hear us do a, a watch along track, this is the, this is what to expect. <laughs> Okay, hold on a second. All right, starting now. We're, cool. we're looking at... Aircrew, report 
yeah this is the scene where like the bridge is there it's just yes. like evangelion like i keep going on about mm-hmm. do you think i was a massive evangelion fan but I'm it does luke- sound like i'm it. a pretty lukewarm on it to be honest they're coming up now oh she's gonna say something thank you for what for giving me the strength i needed oh she's thanking them <laughs> and that goes for you as well he looks so slow he's constipated Every life is worth something. Probably he's really horny. <laughs> I know what you meant by that now. I probably need this to understand the next movie. Uh, no. <laughs> Where's the plant? Where is the plant? She doesn't need it anymore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember our bet? No. I have to buy you dinner. Oh, he's going to buy a dinner. To celebrate your victory. Are they going to take care of you as well? I mean, he's done his part, hasn't he? No, I didn't win that. It's a big family outing. <laughs> We'll call it a tie. You know what that means. I have to buy the two of you dinner sometime. Oh, they're all going to have dinner. Yeah. Remember, he, you know, the promise of dinner partway through the film. I remembered as he said it, but I, I would if, you, if you'd asked me before watching this. <laughs> I only watched it yesterday. Okay, now they're watching her walk away. Oh, she's got to kind of look back and talk about something. This music's very Dragon Quest, you know. Is it? Yeah. Mm. It's very Dragon Questy. All right, well, she, she saluted the robot, and now she's leaving. That's it. And it freeze framed. I don't know why they didn't just freeze frame on her saluting. I thought they did. She kind of turns and then she walks away, and it's like she's face. I mean, it's got a nice rule of thirds thing going on. <laughs> I suppose Actually, that's something I neglected to mention throughout this. Um, bashing of the movie well the, the framing was nice the direction i thought was actually was meticulous every single shot was perfectly framed perfectly thought about and you were never missing anything everything was contained in every single shot really really well everything was perfectly framed like um once they um godzilla retreated back to the sea it went back to the that was it the prime minister in the um the, in the war room yeah and like when he stood up everything was like perfectly symmetrical every, every single shot i thought was fantastic um so i have I have to give credit where credit's due there i yeah, think that was it, really well done it definitely was competently made and there's there's no you can't put a value on on that really because when you watch a movie then and you can tell that they don't know what they're doing with the camera that's really annoying and we're not under the false impression that these films are easy to make either like the, at this point it's probably the most complex part of all of the Godzilla series because they're mixing practical effects, composition yep. effects, computer generated effects. So you've got to juggle a lot of things, you've got to spin a lot of plates. So in that regard, that's I mean that's why the action is so good because they do know what they're doing with the action. Mm. So it's exactly what you say like you can bash on the story. The script was terrible and it didn't really carry you in on any sort of journey really. The but... script was better in the Japanese one. Okay. I, I, okay. Fair Some of the things about that English dub were just bizarre like um and they're <laughs> saying her only friend was a plant. That's not a line in the Japanese one. I thought that was just almost laughable. It's kind of true, though. <laughs> uh, um, so, what do you think to the end credits scene? Um, yeah, right. So, <laughs> okay, as we always do, can newcomers come to this? Now, I think I would say they can. Would I want to sit someone down in front of this? I would say no. Even though it's kind of aimed at everyone and it's accessible and you you know you've got the um flashbacks to 54 which kind of explain what happens you've got calls callbacks to other kaiju movies like mothra and war of the gargantuas you know can kind of whet the appetite for other kaiju franchises um you got good action sequences good designs um suit designs um but it's just not interesting enough i think if, they, if that's going to be the first film they see i would say no like they could do, but I would think that that this movie could put people off, in my opinion. Um, and and f- from a personal point of view, the biggest tr- detractor for me was that score, even though it's you know very well written and composed. It's just not my cup of tea with this film. It's just too overbearing. But like I said, I, I wouldn't blame blame her composition. It's just the, it's the pairing of the two things. It just it wasn't a fit. But I mean, those are my personal tastes seeping through, I suppose. So if we're looking at it more objectively, I still think. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give this to a newcomer. I would agree. I would say 
you know, it's it's just not enough meat on the bone. Mm. Um, and even though the Godzilla fights are really good, they are. You need if you're introducing somebody new, you do need to show them a good example of the the human story as well. Yeah, because every single one has it, so you need to show them a good example. So I would say, nah, no, don't bother with this one so much for a first viewing. It's not the worst. I'm, just, you know, we've probably exaggerated a bit our dislike. Yeah, you know, one thing. One thing I would say about our our you know in in our attempt to make this show as um, detailed as it, it can be. We don't watch, Ben and I do not watch these movies together because if we did, we would probably be laughing and joking and we'd probably miss massive stuff, massive scenes. And then when we recorded the podcast, all people would get would be a reiteration of whatever we thought, whatever funny thing we said that we wanted to congratulate ourselves about being so funny. (laughs) We we would just say it again on the podcast. And that's not really what we're trying to do here. We're just trying to talk about the movies and enjoy discussing them after the fact. If you were to sit down with a good friend and watch... Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla together. Even if you didn't like it, if you've got a couple of good friends with you, it'd probably be a lot more enjoyable. Even if you if you like the movie or you don't like the movie, that's a very good point. Yeah. Actually, very good point. It's always worth taking into account. We watch these separately for the benefit of the of the podcast, but ordinarily we would probably watch them together and probably not be quite so disdainful. Yeah, it's been a long time since we've watched a Godzilla film together. I suppose why King of the Monsters last year. Yeah, it feels um, a long time. Yeah, it does. We maybe do like uh, watch a long recording at some point. Yeah, maybe. Of ones that we know are like safe bets. <laughs> safe yeah. bet to watch. <laughs> um, it, we, we do like to kind of dig a bit deeper and talk about these films, but you know, we can only talk about what's being given to us and there's not, yeah, as you said, not enough meat on the bone for us to really kind of go in depth with this one. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Graham, have you got anything else you want to add? Not really. No. Um, if you like listening to Ben and I talk about this, well, you're in luck because I think there's like six more of these that we've already done. Actually, this is the sixth. Oh, well, there you go then. Yeah. There's five. There's and five others. If you want to hear more Monster Island radios, I would strongly advise you to say so. Yes. <laughs> okay. Where can they find you, Gray? Uh If you want to talk to me and tell me how wrong I am about this, <laughs> uh, I'm Fossil Arcade on on everything so and if you want to follow our twitter or instagram instagram is monster island radio on twitter it's monster island rp and we're also on youtube which is monster island radio uh we upload the episodes there as well and that's about it so until we talk about tokyo sos in the next episode i'm not, i'm looking forward to that you're looking forward to it yes <laughs> <laughs> Okay, until next time. Bye. Bye.